The Fed shut down Buffalo's flagship service. This is a notice of suspension for your flight. And the water bomber crews face danger on a daring wintertime flight across Canada. We can't see with the weather ahead of us. Hang on to your hats, boy. It's been a tough winter at Buffalo Airways. The recession has hit the aviation industry hard, especially in Yellowknife, where mining exploration has dried up. That's left a lot of planes on the ground. To weather the hard times, Buffalo Airways president Joe McBrien and his two sons, Mikey and Rod, are gambling on an extraordinary contract. The 215 deal came at a good time, you know, with economic downturn. That's basically um, luck of the draw and Joe making the right decisions. The right decision Joe made was to sell two CL215 water bombers to the Turkish government for $7 million. Thank you. Thank you, Pleasure. Thank you. But there's a catch. The deal requires Buffalo to fly the short-haul low-flying planes across the country in winter conditions they're not built for, and then halfway around the world to Turkey via the stormy North Atlantic. Probably the toughest part of the journey is getting across Canada. Now in Red Deer, Alberta, it's takeoff time on the first leg of this marathon journey. Chief pilot Arnie Schrader is in the lead. Yes, what is one big WG is UIWG. Arnie's co-pilot is one of Buffalo's young guns, Justin Simley. Well, there had been so much talk and pre-planning, it was nice to just get the job started and get going. Crewing the second plane are Dave Poole and George Fury. Red your radio, it's uh, Buffalo Tanker 298. Two experienced pilots hired especially for this job. I don't think there could be a better crew assembled. I take a commitment to, to move these airplanes uh, halfway across the world, and, and they step up to the plate to get it done and get it done right. Uh, tower, you're clear for takeoff. Tiger 299, clear for takeoff. Tower's coming up. Hey, fire's gone up. There's 30 inches. Hey, and we're rolling. Good to go. Their first stopover is in Winnipeg, Manitoba, 1,200 kilometers away, a six-hour flight. These low-flying, slow-flying planes are built for the heat of summer, not winter cold, and they'll need clear skies all the way. Tiger 299, uh, maintain 9,500 VFR. VFR, summertime airplane, is what we're dealing with here. VFR, visual flight rules. To fly this plane, they have to see where they're going. When you're going in a VFR airplane, it has no de-icing equipment. It has big, fat wings that lice up. And so it's not just a walk in the park. It's a very dangerous trip. And to top it off, these 215s can only fly 600 kilometers before refueling. Each leg of the journey across Canada and the Atlantic crossing is at least double that. Mechanic Corey Dodd and his team installed four 500-gallon fuel bladders to extend the range of each plane. Now, it's time to test the new system. The extra fuel must flow from the bladders up to the main tanks in the wings. I'd like to get all the testing done before we cross the ocean. Make sure it all works. It's alive! <laughs> Running good, Corey. Bye there, George. Just checking to uh, see if you're still by. We transferred uh, 1,000 pounds of fuel. Yeah, we're doing the same process now. We've got uh, we got the uh, left tank up to 3,000 pounds. We're just working on the right tank now. That's a lot easier than landing. Yeah, yeah. There's the beam. Twister tank. 
After a six-hour flight, the 215s touch down in Winnipeg. For nearly six months, Jeremy Dow has been paying his dues working long hours as a ramp hand in Hay River. His goal is to become the next Buffalo co-pilot. It's freaking loud, first of all. Second of all, it's been a long ass day. Usually for uh, getting into the co-pilot seat next is all based on when you arrived. They quoted me seven months from the day I started to when I start flying, and I now realize that might have been just a good way to get me on. Jeremy's been at Buffalo almost six months, but the boss says it's not just about seniority. Yes, I have a, a loyalty to look at his length of service, but just because numbers up doesn't mean he moves. So I have to look at what he is given in to see what he gets back. Right now, the rampy who Joe feels has given the most is Audrey Marchand. Only a few months into her training at Buffalo, Audrey has impressed Joe with her keen attitude and hustle. I want to be in the cockpit because I deserve to be there. There's Audrey getting another flight. A girl with the same credentials as the next guy in line may get a boost up just because she's a girl. Sometimes you have to take advantage of what you got. <sighs> and what Jeremy's got, all 245 pounds of it, has gotten him nowhere. Now, he has even more competition. Buffalo's newest rampy is Wilf Dar. As far as rampies goes, I'm probably a little overqualified, but uh, as far as big planes go, I've got no knowledge, so I'm really in the same boat as everyone else on the ramp. And he's willing to work the ramp without complaining, even though he's got the most flying hours of any rampy. There's no such thing as a little ice or frost, and they, they're pretty serious about getting it all off. There's just not a lot of excuse to have any on, so. They preach the word of God with boldness. A devout Christian, Wilf got his pilot's license at Bible college. Since moving to Yellowknife, he's joined a local church, and he's determined to find his place at Buffalo, too. I have faith that it'll all work itself out. I'm not worried. But Jeremy is getting impatient. Can I get on? Yeah, I guess so. Just this time. I've been here five months working the ramp and courier. I'm next in line for an airplane. Oh, I'm going to catch hell. But if his bitter attitude doesn't improve, you may see Wilf move ahead of him in the pecking order, just like Audrey did. It's the people that have a, an entitlement to being a pilot that hold themselves back. And you care less and less every day. <laughs> Basically, do your job. You're a good rampy. If you do anything that's not your job or bitch, you're a bad rampy. And now, there's trouble brewing at Buffalo HQ. Joe's just received disturbing news. No, this is a notice of suspension for your flight. If you do nothing on that date, your license is suspended. Before that date, yeah. And they can't hold it over your head, to, like a gun to your head, saying, oh, you're 30 days up. Government regulators want to shut down Joe's pride and joy, the daily passenger service known as the SCED. The sked runs from Hay River to Yellowknife in the morning and returns in the evening. For the past 27 years, Buffalo Joe has flown a 1940s DC-3 there and back every day. It's the flagship of Buffalo Airways. We have today two windows exit on the right. Federal regulations dictate that Buffalo has a qualified flight attendant manager on staff to supervise and train flight attendants for the sked but they've been operating without that manager for nearly a month. He said, because we uh, fired our flight attendant manager in January on very short notice that we're author of our own problem. 
Joe's taking the notice of suspension personally. I'm not going to forget it. And I'm not going to let them get away with it. So they better fire a really, really good bullet. Because if they miss, I'll turn that bullet around and fire right back at them. His first move is to find someone at Buffalo who can train fast to be the new flight attendant manager and pass the qualifying exam. Hey, Dad. Can you see for a minute? Weighing the odds, Joe chooses co-pilot Dan Catoni. Dan used to be a high school teacher. You know how to write an exam in mid lots, right? Yeah, I can say that I read it's open book, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. I think we printed up 2,000 pages. Of course, there's no way to learn all this stuff. So what I've been doing is tagging and flagging everything so I can quickly lo uh, look up the required information. If I don't pass this exam, then the scheduled passenger service between Hay River and Yellowknife will be put on hold. So there's lots of pressure on this. The future of Buffalo's flagship passenger run is resting on Dan's shoulders. Coming up, Dan takes the exam, but the outcome isn't looking good. I'm totally in the dark. I don't know. I, I might have passed or I might have failed. In Winnipeg, Buffalo's water bomber crew prepares to depart on the next leg of their cross-Canada journey. This is the most important part of the trip, lunch. We're ready for Montreal now. Let's do it. After a night in the Winnipeg hangar, the plane engines are warmed and ready to go, and the weather conditions are perfect. But they have to leave early, or else they'll reach Montreal after nightfall. Uh, I mean, the concern with flying those airplanes uh, at night uh, in the dark is that uh, you can't see the ice build up on your wings. The airplane's not equipped for icing, so that's the biggest concern. Icing, a serious problem for the CL-215, which is not intended for winter travel. It's designed to be a water bomber that's operated in the summer. Icing reduces the wing's ability to create lift, and without de-icing equipment, a buildup of ice on the wings of the 215s could be deadly. Uh, tower confirmed, 299 plus one's cleared for takeoff. Tiger, 299, clear takeoff, 31 right, turn out. 15 two. Two water bombers take off on the 14-hour flight to Montreal, 1,800 kilometers away, their longest stretch over land. Check 299 Ranger. I wonder if I could get their forecast, please, for the rest of the day. Over the Great Lakes, they can't get high enough to fly over the clouds. Sure enough, they encounter icing. The pilot's only option is to fly around the clouds. Picking up a little ice. Toronto Center, it's Tiger 298, 55 miles out of North Bay. But rerouting could ruin their plan to reach Montreal before dark. Back in Yellowknife, government regulators want to close down Buffalo's flagship run called the SCED because there's no longer a flight attendant manager on staff a regulatory requirement. Okay. Now go inside and hide for a bit. And that also means there's no one to teach the flight attendant course Jeremy Dow was counting on taking. Flight attending is sort of the intermediate step between Rampy and uh, pilot. But Jeremy works at the Hay River Hangar. To take the course at company headquarters in Yellowknife, he needs to train his replacement. So he's recruited his good friend from flight school, Ramon Stravastava. He's uh, very intelligent. He's got a, at least one master's degree under his belt. But up here in the north, he's only got below zero degrees to contend with, not the kind he's used to back in his home in India. Probably like, you know, two days, three days, you take time to get used to of this kind of weather. But after some time, yeah, you'll rock on it for sure. New challenging task, enjoying it. I'm getting paid just to do some manual labor, which is like <laughs> creating extra muscles, yeah. But Ramon isn't quite the human forklift that Jeremy is. 
the people are doing here, they are also human beings, right? Like me. They might be a little stronger than me, body-wise, but same kind of built and everything, so why can't I? But a positive attitude isn't enough to slog around hundreds of pounds of cargo and equipment all day. He's growing some muscles, but he's still, yeah, he's struggling a bit with the, uh, with the physical aspect of it. But today, the physical aspect of rampy work has taken its toll on Ramon. I'm not feeling too good. My back is hurting. That's the first time when I'm taking my off, actually, day off. I'm not feeling good, actually. I can definitely see where this kind of work would be easier for me than Ramon, because a couple of these pieces weigh about as much as he does. This one's all right. If Ramon stays uh, bedridden and I have to cover for him, that means I'm stuck down in Hay River when potentially the flight attending course is going on, meaning other people are getting trained as flight attendants, and I'm staying down here getting screwed royally. Like, really, really boned. Back in Yellowknife, Joe is feeling the same way. All the regulatory forces that you deal with, they make it miserable for you. They make it miserable enough that you wonder why you do it. But you can't cave into them and, and be of a disservice to your communities. Joe's counting on Dan Catoni acing the flight attendant manager exam. Poor Dan Catoni. My heart goes out to him. He's sitting in there studying his ass off. Dan takes the written test and is grilled by Transport Canada in the interview. But even with all of his cramming, he's not feeling confident. I'm totally in the dark. I don't know. I, I might have passed or I might have failed. I don't know. Meanwhile, on their way from Winnipeg to Montreal, Arnie, Justin, and the rest of the crew are running late. They've had to divert their two water bombers over the Great Lakes to avoid clouds and icing. Now, 100 kilometers from Montreal, they're flying in the dark in VFR aircraft. There's no radar on board. They have to rely on what they can see out the cockpit window. All they have is a compass and GPS. Yeah, that's my hole up there somewhere. There's a light. Finally, they spot lights in the distance. Looks like a big city. And Montreal arrival, it's uh, Tanker 298. Montreal Center, Roger. Now they have to pick out the runway from the spectacular nighttime view of Montreal. I got it. Field in sight. You got it? I got the right one. Okay. One over here. Yeah, I'll just a little bit. I'll pick the little glider. All right, here's down. Pre landing. That was collapse just dead. Water bombers touch down after a long day's flight. But on the ground, a nasty surprise. You can't get two airplanes in here, and it's no use freezing one up. It's stupid. You got to have enough room for two airplanes. Put one in, hold it nose that way, and put this one tail in this way. Yeah. Do it. But when push comes to shove, both 215s fit. With the night in the warm hangar, the plane should be ready in the morning for the final leg of their cross-Canada journey. Coming up, while the crew sleeps, the water bombers get the bum's rush. Oh, Christ, she's all full of snow too, didn't he? Morning in Montreal. Hello. Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader gets an alarming call from mechanic Corey Dodd at the airport. Oh, Christ, she's all full of snow too, didn't he? Last night, they tucked the two CL-215 water bombers away in a hangar. But sometime overnight, the planes were dragged out into the cold to make room for another aircraft. We're 
renting hangar space and we're, we're buying copious amounts of fuel from these guys and they, they push our airplanes out into the snowbank to freeze up. And that's about the worst customer service you can have. So we've got frozen airplanes covered in ice we can't take off. These airplanes are not designed to be parked in that, those type, type of temperatures. You have to get them in a hangar to make them operate properly. So we push the airplanes back in the hangar, thaw them out, uh, get them ready to go. Before starting up the 215s, engine oil temperatures have to be above freezing. If not, the engine cylinders could crack. That's why they're supposed to stay in the hangar overnight. After hours in the hangar, the 215s are finally warmed up enough to fly. Clear skies over Montreal look promising, but the weather en route is not so sunny. So we're just going to have this little crap in here, eh? We'll, we'll end up flying most of the trip at the night, and we can't see with the weather ahead of us. Night flights in VFR planes are a huge risk. It's starting so late, that's why I didn't want to do this at all in, at night. Yeah. So what do you think? Well, I'll give it a whirl. The hell? We'll go, we'll go down God hates the coward. And if it, if it looks like it's going to... With the delivery of the water bombers to Turkey already jeopardized by delays, Arnie's ready to go. But then George Fury calls for a pilot's report from St. John's. Actually, I'm leaving uh, Montreal very shortly in a CL-215. We're, uh, we're concerned about some tops around Deer Lake area. Either way, it's Weather conditions along the route aren't looking good. So light snow showers? You gonna stay like that all the evening, or? Okay, thanks. Tops 13,000 feet, light ice. And the clouds near St. John's are too high to fly over. It's not much sense. And if we're stuck in it for any amount of time, we're just gonna build up Halifax right here. Our concern with going at night into possible icing conditions was that we, we wouldn't be aware of it until it was too late. Their only alternative is to stay put in Montreal. So we've got Nolan Air for sure, it's no problem. Can you Justin finds their planes a new hangar at another local airport so they don't get bumped out into the cold again. I was just going over to Mirabeau. We got a good hangar over there. They're not going to kick us out in the middle of the night, let our airplanes freeze up on us. Things have gotten complicated today. Back in Yellowknife. Joe here. Joe gets Dan's exam results for the vacant flight attendant manager position. Yeah. Right. Dan passed the written test, but he failed the interview. The sked is shut down. This is a huge deal. Since 1982, we've been flying this thing. It's like 27 years. We don't have a flight attending manager, therefore we can't have flight attendants. Therefore, we can't run an aircraft that's capable of carrying over 19 passengers, which is our DC-3s. The next day in Hay River, Buffalo Joe comes up with a temporary solution to keep the sked running. He's leased a twin Otter, a small plane that can seat up to 18, and hired a pilot to transport his passengers. But it means spending $4,000 per trip. Joe still insists on flying the DC-3, but he can only carry freight, which the smaller twin Otter has no room for. Joe loves passengers, makes them happy every day, so. I don't know how, uh, how happy he must be right now running the freighter. First time in 30 years, I couldn't bring those same people. Now, those people I fly back and forth are second and third generation passengers for me. Watch your head, sir. And they just couldn't understand why I couldn't fly them. As Joe taxis towards the runway in the DC-3, his passengers follow behind in the Twin Otter. That's what you get when you get uh, bureaucratic government against private enterprise.
Adding insult to injury, Joe is greeted by a Transport Canada inspector when he lands in Yellowknife. He's ramp checking Joe to make sure the DC-3 isn't carrying any passengers. I'm checking me. No, I'm just here to uh, observe and uh, admire the DC-3 aircraft. Oh, shit. <laughs> of course I don't have any people in the airplane. I'm flying a freighter. Mm -hmm. There isn't even seats in that airplane, but they got to come out and verify that I'm, because they expect me to lie. Joe is playing by the rules. His passengers are all on board the Twin Otter that's just arrived. With Transport Canada breathing down his neck, Joe needs Dan Catoni to give the flight attendant manager interview another try. I hope I do better this time, second time around. Buffalo's flight operations manager, Mike Hanley, helps him prepare. These interviews are very persuasive where you have a fear of what you're going to say. And I bet you that's what happened with you, too, is you almost stunted yourself sometimes on saying something, oh, oh yeah. thinking I'm saying and, the wrong thing. And there are things in there, like he, Joe wants to make sure like Dan he, gets all the help he needs to pass the interview. The process. There's no way that I, I said, yes, I do see them every day. We yeah. can talk, but the amendments are, are written. This will be Dan's last chance. If he fails again, Buffalo's daily passenger service will be history. The end of another day of turmoil at Buffalo Airways. With no daily passenger service, Jeremy Dow's ambitions of moving off the ramp and into flight attendant training have been stymied. But the SCED suspension may be a blessing in disguise. It could give Rampy Ramon's ailing back a chance to heal. Hey, buddy, what's up? Feeling better? Feeling a little bit better? It's OK. It's OK? Joe wanted me to tell you that he would like you to stay here, still getting paid, just taking time off. He really appreciates the work you've been doing. He knows you've been working your ass off. I'm not going to take free money. Definitely, if I'll stay here, definitely I will do something. But you hurt yourself on the company time, though. The company wants to be reimbursing you for it. Even if you are laid up for a couple weeks, they're still happy as hell with you, you know? You know, you're being supported through all this. And... Yeah, definitely I'll take some time to think about it for sure. Jeremy needs Ramon to get well and get back to work so he can take over for Jeremy in Hay River. I got very good feedback from Jeremy, and he's really concerning about my injuries and everything. But Ramon is getting pressure from home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. How's everybody out there? I talked to my family members, actually, even my fiance. She's saying, come back. I don't know. No, no, I'm totally confused, totally confused what to do now. The next day, Dan Catoni returns from his second try at the flight attendant manager interview. Hey, hey, Dan. Yeah. How's it going? Well, congratulations. Wow, uh, thanks. Nice, everything? It's about time, eh? Oh, yeah, so this is a brand new day now, right? right? Yeah. Dan passed with flying colors. Which means that everything goes back to normal instantly. The sked is back in business. What's it feel like to have your sked back? Well, oh, good, good, good. It feels good like finding your pants after a long night. Okay. Joe's DC-3 can carry passengers again, and Dan Catoni can begin training rampies as flight attendants. Audrey Marchand is already in the course, but who else? For Jeremy Dow, the answer is obvious. I'm meant to be at the controls of an airplane, not a driving courier van. But Jeremy's not going anywhere unless his buddy Ramon recovers from his back injury and decides to stick around. I came here for the x-rays and everything. At the hospital in Hay River, Ramon braces himself for the worst. This is your spine. These are the bones, the vertebrae. Uh -huh. And they all look completely normal. There's nothing crushed okay. and nothing out of line. And I don't see that it's bent or broken in any way. Uh -huh. So the main thing I would say is to avoid heavy lifting. For how long? Uh, another week. Another week? Yeah. But this is good news. That's great. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, that's good words. I'm happy. Happy, nothing major. 
Nå sin bilhjul. Nå, på snur. Nå sin bilhjul. Nice. Ja. Nice. Takk, venn. Takk. Feeling happy, man. Ja. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Got your place back in the company. Oh, yeah. You know what everybody I thinks of me now? Survive. So that's what I gotta do. I gotta get hurt so people appreciate me, too. <laughs> His spirits lifted, but ignoring doctor's orders to lay off the lifting. Ramon is a rampy again. Ramon's return is in the nick of time. The flight attendant training course begins next week in Yellowknife, and Jeremy wants to be there. I came back, man. You should appreciate it. I appreciate it very much, and I just feel like having fun with you now. <laughs> In Montreal, the weather isn't looking good for the water bomber crews. Well, here we are in Montreal. We got a, just a wicked snowstorm that's blowing through here, and it's going to hit uh, Newfoundland. So I think we're probably going to be here for a couple of days. Since they're snowed in, Justin, Arnie, and the rest of the crew decide to do a little shopping. What do you think? Come on, you guys. Then acclimatize their northern bodies to Mediterranean temperatures. We're just warming up from the yellow night winter. The life of an engineer. You know, waiting for weather is always a tough part of the job, but uh, you get in a nice hotel, uh, you know, you can relax, and uh, we'll get to St. John's soon enough. Across the country in Yellowknife, the sked is back up and running. But there's a new problem. An urgent piece of cargo is too big to fit on the sked flight to Hay River. It's going to have to be a rush delivery by truck. Buffalo's newest rampy, Wilf Dar, steps up to meet the challenge. Is there a deadline, Mike? Fuck. Oh. Wilf just got promoted to first officer, cube van. Captain cube van. With a five hour drive ahead of him, Wilf has no time to spare if he's going to meet Joe's evening sked flight carrying the rest of the cargo. The uh, road's been covered a bit with snow and ice and felt the wheels slip a little. Wilf has to take the long way around Great Slave Lake, almost 500 kilometers. Joe's sked will fly 200 kilometers straight across. In Yellowknife, the DC-3 is fueled and made ready for the evening flight to Hay River. 300 kilometers away in Fort Providence, Wilf is fueling up as well. Apparently, the truck doesn't have the range that we thought it did. Thank you. A necessary stop, but this delay could cost Wilf valuable time to meet the sked in Hay River. As Joe lifts the DC-3 into the evening sky, Captain Cube Van hits the ice road, a 24-kilometer drive down the Mackenzie River. We are now about an hour and a half out of uh, Hay River. We'll get there when we get there. I'm not gonna, not gonna kill myself for a load. But if he can meet his deadline in Hay River, Wilf knows it could help push him to the head of the rampy pack. There's definitely some competition. Most of these pilots have uh, dreamed of flying airplanes since they were young. Joe's DC-3 arrives in Hay River. Jeremy and Ramon are on the ramp to meet the flight, but still no sign of Wilf. If he's going to be a hero, he'd better step on it. As all the cargo is unloaded from the plane, Wilf arrives. Well, Wolf stepped it up, put a little extra coals to the fire, got the thing there on time, and, and he got an attaboy out of the whole thing, and which is he did, he really deserved it. And everybody's happy. And everything else could be somebody else's problem. Can be or is. <laughs> Wolf made his deadline, and Buffalo Joe is impressed. Our job is to deliver the freight, and he did a good job of delivering it on time, so customers happy. Thank you. Another new rampy is out Sean Jeremy this time on his home turf in Hay River. Later that night, it gets worse. What's that? 
when Ramon's parents delivered tragic news about a close friend. When I uh, about to go for the sleep, I heard that news, yeah, he committed a suicide. This news could change everything for Ramon and Jeremy. My girlfriend and parents want me to come back, so. I made a decision now. Can't compromise with this now. It's bad news all around. Rampy Ramon Srabastava received a call from India. A close friend has died, and Ramon's family wants him to return. He makes a tough decision. After three months in the north, Ramon's giving up on Buffalo and going home. My dream was always to become a pilot. That was my childhood dream. It's like watch, you gave it to me, this watch. That is the best souvenir I got it ever in my life, actually. I appreciate this thing. Co-worker Jeremy Dow is stunned. I wasn't expecting Ramon to say he was quitting. It's kind of crappy. Like, Jeremy, uh, I'm going to miss him. Like, he was all the time guiding me, man. You know, you have to prove yourself. Uh, I'm going to miss everything, every single thing, you know? Today is a really shitty day. Today, Ramon quit. Today, I'm screwed. And I can't find my clothes. I get to do his, do his duties, do his tasks until, uh, until they can find somebody to replace me or until I get frustrated enough being here to quit. In Yellowknife, Mikey has a job vacancy to fill. So basically what you're telling me is we need someone to replace Ramon. We need him now. Buffalo co-pilot Scott Blue has been helping Mikey recruit Rampies. He also weighs in on which Rampy gets into the flight attendant course. I believe if, if Wolf is harder working and is himself a better position than Jeremy, I believe that Wolf should have the shot of getting into the airplane. Maybe Wolf's fresh, keen, ready to go, boom, boom, boom. Jeremy's been a little bit more worn down by, you know, the monotony of the job, repetition, long hours, all that crap. And I think it's only fair to give Jeremy a crack. You can't take away from the fact that you got, you know, months of work, you know, out of Jeremy. Yeah, you have to leave Jeremy out of the first flight attendant course and maybe stagger him somewhere else. But is that going to piss Jeremy off because he's been here longer than the other two? That's going to yeah, drag like... his gear something fierce, man. Mikey knows it may not be a popular decision. But without Ramon to replace him on the ramp, Jeremy can't move into the flight attendant course. Audrey's already been told she's in. <laughs> and now, Wilf will jump ahead of Jeremy, too. Wilf, he was a skydive pilot for the last two summers, I believe. He's got about 750 hours under his belt. A lot more experience uh, real world flying than I have or that any of the other rampies have, actually. Ah, it bugs me a little bit that Audrey and Wilf are going to get the, the nod before me, you know? But uh, I keep telling myself, suck it up, buttercup, I'll be fine. That works usually. Because that's usually what I tell other people. I love my job. Jeremy sucks it up. Ramon is all packed and ready to go. He's heading home to India. At the Buffalo cargo terminal in Yellowknife, Kelly Jurasevic and Janelle Glenn aren't surprised he's leaving. Well, when he started here, he was he couldn't pick up anything. I think he blew a nut the first day <laughs> when he picked up that crate in the front office, man. He ate, holy, remember that? Yeah, well, I was it on was the DC3 hilarious. with him and Ian, and, uh, oh, yeah. and uh, he, I threw him a box, and he's, he kind of screamed. <laughs> yeah. He was freezing his ass off. It was too cold. So we kind of had a thing going that we knew he wasn't going to last. So we should have, you know, had a pool on this, and I should have won. <laughs> yeah. No sympathy for Ramon in the cargo terminal, but Buffalo Joe appreciates his effort. He did very well under the circumstances he's working under. From lions and tigers one week to polar bears and caribou the next wasn't bad. Joe was awesome. Like, he built himself. He built his name. 
Joe's used to the high turnover in the rampy ranks. I just want to say thanks to you for everything, Joe. Let me know. Yeah, for sure. Well, there's always a remand coming. Always one leaving. Sometimes the same one comes back for another try at it. It was really nice to be with you. Really nice. It's my pleasure, sir. I'm leaving so many good people. And then, one final you goodbye. Know? All the best, buddy. Jeremy's not only losing his friend. See you later. See you, man. See good you. Travels. Thanks. He's losing his ticket out of Hay River as well. Nothing, nothing better than this. Nothing better than this. Certainly imperfect. I wasn't expecting him to leave so quickly. They waited days for flying conditions to improve. Now, Buffalo's water bomber crew must make a hasty exit out of Montreal. They're on the final leg of their cross-Canada journey to St. John's, Newfoundland, before heading on to their ultimate destination, Turkey. It looks good. We've got a window of opportunity today to, to head out. Well, that one was sitting offshore there, I guess. There's one. OK, so there it is. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah. That's this morning at 7 o'clock. But a major winter storm is approaching St. John's, so there's no time to waste. Thank you, 299, we check, uh, we're clear to go. Thank you. Code, uh, let's just follow this clock. Tiger 299, ready for takeoff? Yeah, we're ready to go. Okay, let's rock and roll. 3, 2, 5, 3, 0, get us a trap. 5, 3, 0, set. Tanker 299 plus one. Hey, friend. Set course for St. John's. The water bombers must get there before the storm hits, for these summer planes will be caked in ice before they reach their destination. No real concerns yet, but as you know, that weather in Newfoundland is awful fast. So. Montreal to St. John's is a 1,600-kilometer flight. The pilots are hoping the clear skies last. That's good. So that's the Gulf of St. Lawrence, man. That water looks cold, eh? 613, contact by But as they cross the Gulf of St. Lawrence, they can see the storm approaching. Just uh, check the weather. Uh, of course, St. John's is still the same. It's uh, showing 2200 overcaster. OK, thanks, George. The water bombers are traveling at 200 kilometers per hour and they still have a few more hours in the air. Minus one. Now, it's a race against Mother Nature. They finally reach the edge of the continent. Nice way today. Yeah. Beat the storm to St. John's, but just barely. We played it exactly perfect. <laughs> Holy smokes, did we ever, man. That's a, almost a hurricane out there. It's pretty windy. The crew and the planes made it across the country safely. But crossing the treacherous North Atlantic will be an even greater challenge. On the next episode of Ice Pilots and WT, the water bomber pilots prepare for the worst over the North Atlantic. Dick chain, dick chain, dick chain. When tragedy strikes just offshore. So far, finding only one survivor. The North Atlantic is nothing to play with. AJ finally takes the plunge. And engineers prepare an Electra for its maiden mission. Why didn't we check all this sucking stuff before we went out of the hangar? Overpaid, you prima donnas.